Galaxy 666 by Pal Toro. Session 15. Welcome back, everyone, to Galaxy 666, your ever-present guide to here. The middle of Chapter 5 finds our heroes up the proverbial creek without the metaphorical paddle. To it, something has finally started to happen. This makes it a good time to take stock of where we are. So where are we? As we mentioned in the very first session, there is a question of whether in fact we are dealing with a galaxy or a planet. Here our team is seemingly focused on one planetary system, the one with that apocryphal planet in it. Apparently, as they are approaching the star of the system, they start to jump toward it so that it explodes to twice its size several times. So our start point would have to be reasonably close to a star to begin with, so that the effect of the doubling is noticeable. To demonstrate what I mean, here's a little experiment you can try out sometime. On a beach, at a very large park, or even down a very long straight road, place a standard-sized paper plate, about 8 inches in diameter, on a wall, or up on an edge, so that it can stand unsupported. Now walk away from it for 10 paces, and look back at the paper plate. The paper plate will now have the same apparent size as our sun would have when seen from Mercury. Now take nine paces further from the plate and look back at it. It now has the same relative size of the sun as seen from Venus. Seven more paces, and you have the sun size in our own sky. Go ahead and compare it. Don't look directly at the sun or burn your eyes or anything of that nature, but you've seen the sun behind clouds. You get a rough idea for its size. It's about the size of that paper plate. Walk another 14 paces, and you're at Mars. In just 40 total paces, we have visited half our solar system's planets, but we still have four to go, and it takes another 95 paces just to get to Jupiter, our first gas giant planet. Another 112 to Saturn, 249 to Uranus, 281 to Neptune, and, just for fun, walk an additional 242 paces to reach the distance of Pluto. Can you even see the plate? At what point would you describe the sun as being able to suddenly explode to twice its size? If that were to happen at Pluto, or even Uranus or Neptune, would you even notice? So our team must be starting from a position within the planetary system of the apocryphal planet, relatively close to the star. And this makes sense, as Bronit decides he can find a habitable planet and take the ship in manually. From what we can tell about planetary formation today, All the potentially habitable planets appear to occupy a sweet spot rather closer to the sun as compared to gas giants and coal giants. And this, in general, appears to be a requirement for all planetary systems, though some moons of gas giants may also prove to be habitable. As the ship and our heroes are jumped toward the sun, their ship is overheated, which is admittedly surprising as the space greyhound was supposed to be the neatest, the sweetest, and the most up-to-date piece of space mechanism that the combined technological resources of the Empire had yet produced. And then the process reverses itself so that they go back to where they started on the rim of the galaxy. But where they started their jumps was close to the star in this planetary system. So the system itself must be on the rim of the galaxy. But if it is, why mention that they are now back on the rim of the galaxy when they actually never left it? The ship now is reduced in capability to the visuals and the direct perceptors, by which I think he means they can look out the windows. But Oski is concerned about spending four hours to repair the damage to the ship. All of my long and convoluted ramblings comes down to this. In Pell's book, time and distance are massively abbreviated. It took NASA's New Horizons spacecraft, the fastest built to date, over eight hours to travel the distance from the Earth to the Moon. So if Oski thinks that they can be someplace else within four hours, like landed on a planet, they must already be in orbit around a planet, or probably well down into the atmosphere, which is truly amazing as they were just kangaroo hopped there by some unknown force. Time and distances when it comes to space are vast, as our little walking experiment demonstrated even with warp systems and other tools of science fiction. Reporting that a crew is a few minutes from falling into a sun, or traveling between planets in a few hours, abandons any sense of the scale of the universe around us, and is more a failing of mankind's inability to imagine and understand such massive numbers than really any error directly attributed to our earnest author. However, what we can attribute to Pell is the reaction of the crew who have just experienced the impossible, 
After their near-death adventure, they respond by discussing things. Who is really in charge of the mission? The possibility of aborting and going home, assuming they can find their way home, about the nature of Galaxy 666. And we, the reader, come to understand that no one is really in charge. No one really knows where they are, and no one really knows what to do. Our most action-packed sequence to date, granted it was just three jumps forward and three jumps back, results in general indecision, conversation, and a lack of focus on the task at hand, which is, in aviator speak, aviate, navigate, communicate. And this is a defining characteristic of Lionel Fanthorpe's writing during his Badger years. Again, I would encourage you to read Lionel's works away from Badger, such as his book, The Black Lion, to truly appreciate the impact of having to write in the Badger environment. But while working with Badger, when a crisis comes or danger threatens, it's time to discuss, pontificate, and philosophize. If you doubt it, meet me back here next week, and together we will see what awaits our team on the fringe of Galaxy 666. Here ends session 15.